Hello, this is week three of lecture. And just in case you didn't see it, uh, we will be online a little bit longer than planned. The original date was returning back to the classroom the week of February 1st. That has now been extended to March 1st. So make sure you check with your instructors and professors to see how that's gonna change things. For us, it's just gonna be the same thing we've been doing for the first two weeks for a little bit longer. For this week, we're going to look at ancient Egypt, and this is not an all-encompassing lecture. There are schools out there that teach an entire semester, if not an entire year, on ancient Egypt, and uh, I'm going to try to cover the basics in about 20 minutes or so. When it comes to Egypt, uh, you have to consider the Nile. Uh, the Nile River is the lifeblood of Egypt, if you will. I've got a map there that kind of shows you uh, where it goes. You'll notice uh, that it flows from the south to the north. It begins uh, where Lake Victoria is, and there's rumors that it even goes past Lake Victoria, or it begins where Lake Tana is, and then it flows north. The Nile, it starts as two different rivers. There's the Blue Nile and the White Nile. The White Nile is longer, but the Blue Nile has more water. The two rivers come together just south of Khartoum, which is in the Sudan, and then it flows through the desert until it exits into the Mediterranean Sea near modern-day Alexandria. The river flows over 4,000 miles. Uh, for the 4,000 miles longest river in the world. One of the reasons that the Nile River is so important is because it, there are these yearly floods and these floods are predictable and the ancient Egyptians knew when the floods were going to happen and by knowing when the floods are going to happen they can plan their agriculture, they can plan their life around those floods. Now when the river would overflow its banks it would deposit nutrients on the soil which would then allow for growing of the food they needed. Some other uses of the Nile, and this this will make sense if you think about it, it's a food source. There are birds, there's fish, they can use it to get food. There's transportation. The ancient Egyptians had boats, and you could go all the way from Lake Victoria to the Mediterranean Sea and only have to get off your boat, I believe it's three times. In fact, you could go all the way from the sea to nearly where Khartoum is without getting out of the boat even once. And it's also useful because of something called papyrus. Papyrus is where we get the word paper from. And this papyrus, it's a reed or a plant. You can pick the plant, you can dry it out, and you can flatten it into the surface you can write on. And the Egyptians used this papyrus to write down their records. And then because of the, the conditions, the dry conditions, low humidity, papyrus was able to be preserved until today, and we're still finding papyrus as we speak. In fact, last week of all things, a new tomb was uncovered with an unknown queen, and in it was a 13-foot scroll made out of papyrus that the archaeologists could read, and they knew what the book was. Another important thing to know about ancient Egypt is we break it up into a couple different parts. And whenever I do this lecture, I always start with pre-dynastic Egypt. And this means the time before the United Kingdom of Egypt. Uh, if you're going to give rough dates, 3500 to 2800 BC will be good enough. If you are speaking to an Egyptologist or somebody who studies Egypt for a living, 
They may give you slightly different dates, but for our purposes, 3500 to 2800 BC, good enough. In pre-dynastic Egypt, there were two different kingdoms. There was the upper kingdom that was located near the city of Luxor, and the lower kingdom, which was located near modern-day Alexandria or the Nile River Delta. Now, because the Nile River flows from the south to the north, upper and lower are swapped from what we would normally think. So the upper kingdom is further south because it's upriver. The lower kingdom is further north because it's downriver. During this pre-dynastic period, the Egyptian way of life kind of gets its beginning and develops. So you get the beginning of agriculture, you get the beginning of the, these advanced tools being made, and eventually their culture is going to expand all along the Nile River, uh, almost all 4,000 miles. The Egyptian... I don't know what to say. The Egyptian society, if you will, like Egypt proper, it's going to go about 600 miles of the Nile. Their, their, um, oh, how do I want to say this? Their effects on the world. How about that? Stretch much, much further, but Egypt proper is going to take up almost 600 miles of the Nile River. Now, eventually, there's going to be this king named Narmer. Uh, we used to think Narmer was mythical until evidence and archaeological materials were found that name him. Uh, Narmer or Menes, uh, we're pretty sure it's the same person now, unified the upper and lower kingdom somewhere around 3100 BC. And when Narmer is going to unite the upper and lower kingdoms, that's when the first dynasty is established. And that's when we can consider the ancient Egyptian kingdom to be created. From here, we go to the Old Kingdom, and it's called the Old Kingdom well, because it's old. Uh, 2800 to 2100 BC will be good enough dates for this. And during this time, the kings are absolute rulers. Like the whole economy is just, a, it's a royal monopoly. Uh, there's a hierarchy of officials from governors of provinces all the way down to just local mayors and tax collectors. And these local mayors, these tax collectors, these governors, they all work for the king. Even the peasants, even the artisans, everybody work for the king. The king can tell everybody what to do. The king is in charge. We know that the old kingdom traded with their neighbors to the south. It was a, a kingdom called Nubia. Uh, today it would be the modern day countries of Ethiopia and South Sudan. And we know that the old kingdom was fairly stable. Uh, their economy was stable, they had plenty of food, the kings kept control of things. Now how powerful were these kings? Uh, well, the pyramids are the easiest way to see how powerful the kings were. I've got the pictures of the great pyramids there. There were other pyramids besides those, but these are the most famous. And if you look at this picture, they look like they're out in the middle of the desert, but what you don't realize is if this cameraman had turned 180 degrees and look behind them, or look behind her, depending. The Great Pyramids are just outside the modern day city of Giza. But the Great Pyramids at Giza are the easiest way to see how powerful these kings were. Uh, the largest pyramid was the tomb of the King Khufu. And according to an early Greek historian named Herodotus. You'll learn about him later. But Herodotus said that the pyramid took over 100,000 men more than 20 years to build. And we used to think that the men and or women who built the pyramids were slaves. But we've actually uncovered paycheck stubs. We've uncovered graffiti. 
and we know that they were actually paid workers. The stones, uh, it's estimated the largest, just the one tomb of Khufu, the largest of these pyramids, has over two million blocks and each one weighs about two and a half tons. Now just think about how powerful Khufu had to be to pay 100,000 men 20 years to move two million stones, each weighing almost 3,000 pounds. If that doesn't say power, I don't know what does. Now, religion in the Old Kingdom, uh, this is probably the religion that you've heard of when it comes to Egypt, even if it's just maybe like for a few minutes in middle school or something like that. Egyptian religion was very polytheistic. Uh, the gods I have listed here, they're not all of them. There were smaller local gods that were like village deities, but the ones I have listed are the big ones. So you've got Geb, who was the god of earth, Ra or Amun, who was the god of the sun, Osiris was the god of the afterlife, Isis was the goddess of fertility. Then you get a little weird. Horus was the son of Osiris and the son of Isis, or, depending on the story, the brother of Osiris. Uh, maybe he was the son and the brother at the same time. I don't know. There's even an interesting story that goes along with this here. Um, according to some traditions, Osiris used to be the god of fertility. His brother slash son Horus got jealous killed Osiris, and then Isis stitched Osiris back together. Because Isis gave new life to Osiris, she became the goddess of fertility, and because Osiris rose from the dead, he became the god of the afterlife. It gets a little weird, but they're interesting stories. Now, the Egyptians, they do believe in an afterlife. Um, in fact, the afterlife is what the Egyptians live for. Life after death was seen as a reward. It was believed that people would perform their usual tasks, but they would be much, much more successful. Uh, the kings would become gods, and government officials would become even more important in the afterlife. The burial rituals of ancient Egypt were all geared towards this afterlife. So if you were a wealthy person and you died, all of your possessions would be buried with you, including servants and animals. Basically, anything that they thought you would need in the next life got buried with you. Bodies are embalmed. Bodies are mummified. Statues of the person are put into the tomb. And that's all because it was believed that the spirit would reincarnate the body. If something happened to the body, then the spirit could reincarnate the statue. And one way or the other, there's going to be something there that your spirit could reanimate and take to the afterlife. There was a book called the Book of the Dead. In the Book of the Dead, it provided the the, all the burial instructions, it told you how to embalm the body, how to prepare the body, how to preserve the body, but it also gave you the steps on how to get to, to the afterlife. It was like a how-to book on how to make it to the next stage. Now, Egyptians also recognized this idea called mat. You may see it M-A-A-T, like I have it spelled here. Sometimes it's M-A apostrophe A-T. So it's either mat or mat-at. I don't speak ancient Egyptian. Uh, this is kind of a hard concept for us to get, so I'm going to describe it the best I can. Uh, today's Egyptologists, they translate it to right order. Basically, everything has to be in balance. Mat exists if everything is in the right order. If the gods are happy, if everything is balanced, good and bad, light and dark, and all these other things, then 
Egypt would be successful. The closest thing I can compare this to is in the religion Taoism. There's the yin and the yang. The light and the dark are balanced. If the world is balanced, then there's this harmony, there's this peace, and Egypt would get overall success. The Old Kingdom is where you get ancient Egyptian writing and ancient Egyptian literature. Uh, hieroglyphics, if you will. Uh, we can read ancient Egyptian because in 1798, the French, led by Napoleon, were trying to conquer Egypt. Napoleon stumbles upon this three-sided stone that was in the desert. He has his troops dig it out, and you end up finding this tall stone that allows us to translate ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. On one side was Greek, on the second side was actual hieroglyphics, and on the third side there was kind of this mix of the two so you could figure out what the different symbols meant. I cannot read hieroglyphics, but I do know somebody who can, and I've been told it's pretty intricate. It's hard to learn at first, but once you get it, you get it. Uh, what I can tell you is that hieroglyphics, there are three different parts. There's phonograms, there's ideograms, and there's determinatives. A phonogram is where the picture stands for a thing. For example, a bird is a bird, a lion is a lion, a person is a person. So that's a phonogram. An ideogram is when the sign represents an idea. So, so maybe the picture of the person is not actually a person. Maybe the picture of the person is standing for a community or a family, an idea. And then you have these things called determinatives. They're extra symbols, but they're unspoken. They give context. If you were looking in English, I would say this is like hyphens, periods, things like that to give you direction on how to read something. Now, if that's not complicated enough, there are no vowels. No vowels whatsoever. The vowels are implied. The vowels are understood. Now let's look at this right here, this circle. If you're doing a phonogram, the circle, it means mouth, like literally your mouth. But for an ideogram, it stands for the letter R or it stands for the god Ra. So a circle can either be the mouth of a person or it can stand for Ra, the God. Now, how do you know? You use the determinative. There will be some symbol near it that tells you, oh, we're talking about somebody's mouth, or, oh, we're talking about the God, Ra. Now, one last thing that I want to tell you about their, their literature, you can read it any direction. Uh, you can read hieroglyphics left to right, right to left, up, down, down, up, however. Now, how do you know which way to read the sentence? It's all about which way the faces are pointing. If the face points from the left to the right, you read the sentence left to right. Now, for their literature, once they have this written language, they start writing books, if you will. And the Egyptians, they have this rich literature. Uh, their works often deal with their myths. Their works often deal with their afterlifes. They have hymns to their various gods. They have stories of their war victories. And they have books on wisdom, books on Proverbs, and the aforementioned Book of the Dead. So they do a lot of writing once they are able to write and once they're able to do a written language. If you're a math person, if you're a science person, the Egyptians used a lot of it. 
Uh, the Egyptians were very good with the basics of arithmetic, the basics of geometry, and they were able to accurately survey the land. And all of those things, arithmetic, geometry, and surveying were important because it allowed them to do their planting. Uh, they could direct water flows where they needed to. And the pyramids are geometrically perfect. The pyramid is a perfect shape. It has just the right slope so it doesn't fall in on itself. It has just the right slope so it doesn't fall apart. And from a top-down view, the base of it is a perfect square. So not only do the pyramids show how powerful the kings were, but the pyramids show how good at math they were too. Uh, going along with, with math and science, you got medicine. Now, their medicine was basically driving demons out of the body, but there were some advances as well. Um, for example, they were able to triage, meaning they could figure out who was curable, who was treatable, and who just needed to be made comfortable until their life came to an end. And we triage today. If you've ever been to the emergency room with a paper cut, you're going to wait a while because they're going to take the person with the broken leg first. It's based on how long can you wait? Are you curable? Or do you just need something to make you comfortable? Or is there no hope for you? So they did that. They also diagnosed illnesses. Now, they didn't always diagnose the illnesses correctly, but there were 48 different medical problems that the Egyptians were able to recognize and diagnose that are still recognized and diagnosed by doctors today. So there's a big step forward when it comes to medication and medicine. Now all good things come to an end. The old kingdom is eventually going to go away. Uh, for whatever reason, somewhere between 2100 and 2000 BC, uh, there's a civil war. We think it's probably because of famine, uh, lack of food, and then things just kind of fall apart. Eventually, a king named Mentu Hotep II will reunify Egypt, and this is the short lived Middle Kingdom. There's not a whole lot to say about the Middle Kingdom other than Mentu Hotep II says, I am a living God. And he creates the idea of the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh is a living God amongst men. So before Mentuhotep II, the kings were just powerful kings. After Mentuhotep II, the kings are known as Pharaohs, and Pharaohs are living gods. Now, what happens to the Middle Kingdom? Well, around 1720, there is a group called the Hyksos who we don't actually know where they come from, uh, but the Hyksos are going to invade Egypt, take it over, destroy the Middle Kingdom. They use horses, bows, arrows, axes, all of this stuff that the Egyptians didn't have, and they conquer. Now the Egyptians are going to learn everything they can from the Hyksos, and somewhere around 200 years later, 150 years later, I should say, the Hyksos are going to be defeated, by the Egyptians who use their own weapons against them. Now, once the Egyptians defeat the Hyksos and kick them out, that's what leads to the New Kingdom. Now the New Kingdom, 1570 to 1000 BC, that'll get you in the right neighborhood. All the kings of the New Kingdom are pharaohs. They all think they're living gods. Now what are the important things to know about the New Kingdom? Well, number one, it's actually the shortest period or it's much shorter than the Old Kingdom is what I should say. The Old Kingdom is when most of the stuff we think of happened with ancient Egypt. Uh, with the New Kingdom, the pharaoh named Amos I is going to defeat the Hyksos and establish a new kingdom. Amunhotep I is going to create the Great Temple of Karnak. Uh, you've probably seen that in, in uh, TV shows before or maybe movies. In ancient Egypt, there's this building that has a whole bunch of gigantic columns. No roof is left. That's what's left of the Great Temple of Karnak. 
Uh, Tutmos the first builds the Valley of the Kings, which is where most of the new kingdom um, royalty is buried. Thutmose the first has a son named Thutmose the second, who marries his wife, who's also his sister, named Hatshepsut. Now, if that's not weird enough, Hatshepsut is going to overthrow her stepson, and Hatshepsut is going to become the first known female pharaoh. Now, Hatshepsut dresses like a man, wears men's clothing, and lives just like any other pharaoh as if she was a god. We didn't actually know Hatshepsut existed until, I think it's about 40 years ago now, when Scientolo uh, scientists, Egyptologists, archaeologists started to look at some of the materials and realized, hey, there's another carving underneath this carving, and they figured out it was a woman. Um, eventually, Hatshepsut's stepson, Thutmose III, will overthrow his mom and destroys all records of his stepmom until, like I said, about 40 years ago, we rediscovered her. Now, moving on a little bit, there's Amenhotep IV, who is married to Nefertiti. Amenhotep is going to declare a new religion. This new religion is going to be monotheistic, meaning one god. Amenhotep is going to change his name to Aton, or the new god's name is going to be Aton, and Amenhotep is going to change his name to Aknaton, which means one who serves Aton. He's even going to build a new capital city called Amarna that's out in the middle of the desert. And he does this possibly because he really believes in this new religion, but for sure because he wanted to get rid of the power that the priests had. He wanted to make himself even more powerful. Now the end result, Amenhotep or Akhenaten makes everybody mad and he's murdered by the priests in the middle of his palace. Now overall that period is known as the Amarna Revolution. The other thing that comes out as Amarna Revolution is King Tut. King Tut is famous just for being famous. He's like the Kardashians of ancient Egypt. The main reason King Tut is so famous is because he was originally the most complete mummy that we had found. He didn't really do anything other than he was a very young pharaoh. Now, this right here, this is just a video for you to watch, and I hope you do. Uh, this guy is somebody who likes to go and explore the world, and he takes a trip to the Valley of the Kings, uh, and this video shows you King Tut's um, tomb, along with some other tombs of Egypt. It's like a four, 14 minute video, I think it is, if I remember correctly. Now what happens to the New Kingdom? If you're curious about the New Kingdom, uh, the Assyrians are going to invade Egypt uh, somewhere in the 900s. And the Assyrians, they don't stay in Egypt for very long, but they basically destroy the Egyptian civilization. And Egypt, of course, continues to exist after the invasion, but they never really uh, become important again. No offense if you have any friends who are Egyptian, but on the world stage, Egypt never regains the level of importance that it had during this time period that I was just talking about. Okay, so moving on. Uh, for this week, let me pull over the calendar for you. We are on week three. So for this week, by midnight on February 1st, you do have to complete your third discussion and your third quiz. So please make sure you get that done by midnight next Monday 
the 1st of February. Now, if there are any questions about anything, let me know. You'll notice that your first reflection paper is coming up. I will talk about that in next week's lecture. So if you're not sure what to do, make sure you watch next week's lecture earlier rather than later to give yourself the most time to do the reflection paper. Uh, you're always welcome to email me both in Blackboard or through your student email, and I will answer you as quickly as I can. Now, as always, thank you for watching this video, and we will talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.